Okay, guys, um, I can see Christian's just joined us. Um, maybe I should just unmute him for a second so we can say hello. Uh, otherwise, um, otherwise, I think we should get started. Um, yeah. And uh, if more people join, then that, that's good. Uh, I, I did get um, more feedback on people joining, but I don't see them on here yet. But maybe they're delayed for some reason. Um, uh, anyway, uh, we are recording this webinar um, so that we can review it if there are some, you know, um, um, treasures in there that we want to look back at, and we will also share it with the rest of the team. Um, this is the first of the kind that we're uh, wanting to introduce um, internally to, to our team uh, in a series of uh, various uh, small lectures, uh, we think 40, 45 minutes maximum, uh, if we can get away with that, um, just to give a little bit of inspiration and also to get some, some activity going in, in between us. Um, and it can range from anything from what Brooks will be talking about today to technical matters in, in post-processing, in, you know, in, in, in composition, it could be about color, it could be anything. And I, I think I will reach out to um, individually to some of you um, to maybe do a presentation if you're interested and if you have something interesting to, to share with the rest of the team, that would be super great. Um, but for this first one, um, we've asked Brooks if he would do a, a small lecture uh, on, on some of the things that he is working with and has been working with in his career. And, and we're super excited um, to have Brooks on board uh, to do that for us. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I, I'll simply, I'll give the computer to, to Brooks um, if I can figure out how to do that. Thank you. And Anders, if you can give me permission to record also. I, I think I'll do that in the, when I okay. give you, hold on, where is that? It's here. Brooks and um, is everybody new to Zoom like we are? Kind of. <laughs> oh, there, make host. Yeah, you are now the host. Okay. Take it away, Brooks. Great. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just. Uh, no, maybe it's fine like it is. We're, we're not that many people. So I'll stay there. Let's, you know, keep the microphones open. You can switch in on and off if, if you like, if there's any background noise. But I'll just leave them open from here. All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll try. And if there's a delay, we'll revert to chats. But let's try and just keep the microphones open and have it more of a open dialogue than a, you know, yeah. listen lecture. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to start by sharing screen here. Um, will this stop others? Continue. I'm going to. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to use my website um, a, as a departure point uh, and because it has a little bit of, uh, uh, of everything on it um, that represents my career. Uh, this first picture is. Uh, uh, shot in Japan, obviously. Um, I was living there uh, and, and I have a this is, um, odd background. I, I grew up in an arts family. My father's a sculptor and lived in Asia and the Middle East when I was uh, a baby and a child. And um, my mother was an art deal, Asian art dealer. Um, so there's been a, an enormous influence of Japan um, in my life. I, I was there when I was three years old in an earthquake. Uh, holding onto a Christmas tree. Um, and then I went back to Japan uh, as an adult to work um, both, I, I used to be a dancer and choreographer um, and also worked in an art department in a school as a photographer in, in Japan. Um, I had the, the luxury of a, a CEO of a company who loved photography and told the, the, the staff administration to um, let me go anytime I wasn't teaching. And if there was something interesting happening to just give me film and wonder and 
um, that they could use and I could use as, as I'd like afterwards. Uh, so the, the credits here do read Smithsonian and National Geographic um, because both th this picture was featured in, in both of them. Um, in Smithsonian, uh, it was a portfolio of my Japanese pictures and then National Geographic used it as the opening spread um, for their National Geographic Travelers um, a portfolio of photographers' work. Uh, people have asked me, you know, um, about this, and it was uh, in a festival uh, called the Aoi Matsui Festival. Absolutely, Japan is full of festivals. So if anybody has any thoughts about going to Japan, I can. Uh, in an exaggerated way, recommend going and going and going. Um, it's absolutely the most photogenic country that I've ever been to. Uh, Italy is number two with being photogenic. Um, but it also depends what you like photographing. Um, so landscape for Iceland is terrific. And, um, but I like culture and city as much as anything else. Um, this was... Uh, be, there, this was an early experience also for me about press and behind the lines and getting close to your subjects. Um, I know Anders had asked me to talk about um, photographing people and how I work with that. Um, and the first thing is just get close. I, I think um, there's a little technical aspect. I see so many people using these huge zoom lenses. Get rid of the zoom lenses if you want to photograph people. Get a simple, you know, prime lens. Let them feel you. Get up close. Communicate with people. Ask permission if you need to. Um, ask permission afterwards if you need to. <laughs> but um, it, it's a matter of body language and trust in a situation like this, where I didn't speak um, any Japanese at the time. Now I just kind of speak uh, sushi Japanese. Um, and um, so that, that's, how, that's how I got this picture. Um, I remember meeting an Italian photographer who had a press badge and I was very sort of envious at the time, said, oh, how'd you get that? And he said, oh, you don't want a press badge in Japan because then you're put behind a press line and you have to like photograph where all the other press is. So I was just wandering around like a tourist. Um, and playing tourist is a very good way of getting people pictures. Um, just blending in and, and not standing out. You know, the American look with the back, the baseball cap worn backwards as if they're, you know, a catcher in baseball with a huge backpack and gear is the first way to alienate people. If you look back at uh, portraiture, there, there was a golden period when people were shooting with medium format Roloflexes. And why? Because the camera wasn't in front of the face. So you were, had a human face communicating with another face and very quietly going click when a picture was need to be taken. The minute you put a box in front of your face, uh, most people get scared um, or they don't feel, there's a subconscious barrier that happens. So avoiding that um, is a good start with taking pictures. Uh, the next picture is another example of a portrait in place. Uh, this is like two or three o'clock in the morning, um, hanging off of a scaffolding um, outside of um, one of the rock churches in Ethiopia. Um, does everybody know about these rock churches in Ethiopia? Okay, it, it, it's absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> the, the 12th century they carved out of a mountainside going down churches out of solid rock. Many stories down, carved out, and then carved inside the chapels. Um, and uh, it, it's, there's, it's the only place on earth like this uh, that I know of. Um, there are cliffside temples in India, uh, Afghanistan, um, Jordan, but nothing that's been carved down and out and around. Um, it's a, in a town called Lalibella. So if you've got nothing to do next Easter, um, go to Lalibella. It's uh, a step back in time. Um, 
uh, I ended up there uh, sort of by accident. Uh, it was 2001. National Geographic Traveler called me and said, uh, can you go photograph the hotel in Zanzibar that they were doing a special edition on Africa? And uh, they said, can you go photograph this hotel that Bill Gates stayed in over the millennium? Um, and I, I, I kind of like rolled my eyeballs on the telephone um, and said, you're not going to send me all the way to Zanzibar just to photograph some hotel that Bill Gates stayed in. And they were like, well, we're not going to send you to Ethiopia to photograph our churches. I said, yes, you are. <laughs> you know, so I ran to the bookstore, did my homework as fast as possible, went online as fast as possible and said, look, if I fly Air Ethiopia to Tanzania to get to Zanzibar, there's no additional cost and it's Easter and it's, I got to go. They were like, okay. Um, so this is a step back in time. The young man is holding a beeswax candle, handmade beeswax cross. Um, and this this is a pre-digital. Um, I'm shooting on film, um, 35 millimeter here, uh, Leica 35 F2, wide open. Um, and film pushed a couple of stops, I guess. Um, Oh, absolutely wonderful country. Um, continuing people. Um, this is my idea of landscapes in Iceland. Um, and th this is a, a Russian couple uh, up at Krafla, uh, a place in the north that's still steaming. Um, and we, we, we have an Icelander here with us, Leve, um, who, who can, you know, nod in testimony about uh, maybe she'll agree with me about how boring most of the landscape books uh, on Iceland are because there's nothing happening in the pictures. It's beautiful landscape, but there's nothing in the foreground. You know, it's just kind of flat background. And, uh, um, and this is just, again, moving quietly, being camera ready. So if you have a backpack, get rid of it. Okay, just have one camera, one lens, and maybe a second lens in your pocket, and always ready. Never keep the lens cap on, just be ready. Um, and in, in a case like this, I asked permission afterwards um, um, because I didn't want to lose the picture and get their names, get their contact information, um, uh, emails. And so that's how I know it's a, a Russian couple. Um, and I, I feel very strongly about getting this information and embedding it in the metadata. Um, I, I, one of my favorite photographers at a certain point in his career, Sebastian Salgado, um, talked about giving people um, a testimony and witness uh, in his photography, but None of them have names. None of them have credits. It's, it's very unusual. So um, being able to communicate with these people after the fact is very important as well. Um, the next picture here is, uh, it's the only time I've grabbed a camera out of somebody's hands. Um, I was with somebody, this is in Grindavik, and uh, there was a guy who said that he needed me to design his brochures and that I didn't have to worry about the photographs because he was a photographer. Um, <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, I, I'm a good designer, but I'm a better photographer, you know, it's okay. Uh, so we're standing there talking to this and I'd waited years to see this situation in Iceland of a fisherman who's, you know, smelling his fermented shark. Now, we, we can see how authentic, you know, how much of an Icelander Loewe is, whether she smiles at the idea a fermented shark or not. <laughs> um, some Icelanders love it um, and others don't. It's, it's uh, very pungent. <laughs> so yeah, this guy had his camera and he wasn't taking a picture. It was just like hanging around his neck. I, I was just like speechless, like, said, give me your camera <laughs> and grabbed it from him to get the picture. <laughs> um, so uh, another Icelandic portrait. Uh, the economic collapse in 2008. Uh, oh, it's called Krepa here. And 
when I showed this to my Icelandic students, they all said like, how did you get this picture? Because this was the architect of uh, the national bank that created the bankruptcy um, for Iceland. And he was ex trying to explain to a Swiss journalist what had happened. Uh, now, one of, it, this is an, on an editorial assignment. Uh, I try and do as much homework as possible um, before the shoot and, and to be ready and be prepared. So I had gotten to the bank early and sitting in the lobby, I picked up a brochure, a financial you know, report of, of the bank and I was skimming through it. Um, they knew many months before the um, collapse that the Icelandic economy was gonna collapse because they had printed it in the brochure. I was just speechless when I saw this data. And so we, we go into the meeting uh, with this guy and it's technically just an interview. So one of my tricks here is I, I call it a trick. I just set my camera on the table and not take pictures and let the interview begin and the dialogue begin between the journalist and the subject. And once they get talking and rolling, then I can pick up my camera and they pay no attention to me. I'm sitting on the floor at a coffee table that's right at his knees. And I asked the question, you know, excuse me, but what is, what is this statistic about the Icelandic economy tanking in September? And here he's like holding his head, trying to explain as if he didn't know anything about it. It's absolutely fantastic scene. <laughs> um, for Icelanders, you know, who lived through the bankruptcy, um, it's a it's a poignant picture. Now, this is the exactly the opposite, um, and uh, this is not an individual who I particularly like. Um, uh, you know, is the, the the Trump of Italy, um, but um, Berlusconi, who was prime minister, um, this was a an assignment uh, by the production company. Uh, to photograph behind the scenes of a video that they were making. Um, so uh, shooting in medium format, uh, Mamiya 6.6, um, uh, absolutely extraordinary camera. And the only reason I don't use it anymore is because I can't work with film in Iceland. It's not a practical reality. Um, um, the, the, uh, I, I've done various pictures like this with portraits with paintings because I've photographed a lot of paintings for Italian art magazines, I, I can kind of blend the two. Um, but it's, you know, it's a political setup picture. This is uh, on the street in Zanzibar on the Bill Gates uh, shoot, medium format. Um, Which camera? Uh, the Mamiya 6.6. Six. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, to me, one absolutely the most wonderful street camera. Um, so let me step back a bit uh, for a second. Um, I, I um, first learned about photography from my father, uh, who not only was an uh, artist, but also a photographer. And when we were traveling in Asia, he had two Roloflexes, one for color and one for black and white. And I would be riding on his sh shoulders. So I kind of learned you know, if there's something interesting, as he would lean over to look in the Roloflex, my body would go with him, kind of like bow to a subject. Anything that's interesting, you know, you, you, you bow to it. Um, and uh, th that um, that continued. So I, I, you know, I learned how to load film. I was in a dark room when I was, you know, five years old kind of thing. I worked as an assistant in New York for a top commercial photographer. Um, I'm not religious about equipment, but I'm very fussy about equipment. Um, so I've worked in every format, basically, um, large format, medium format, uh, sign arms, Hasselblad's, Mamiya's, uh, uh, obscure um, speed graphics, uh, Leica's, Contax, Nikon's, Canon's, I've, I've tried them all. Um, uh, this is certainly one of the most enjoyable cameras that exists the Mamiya 6x6. Six six. It collapses flat, takes up less space than a 35 millimeter. It's faster than uh, any point and shoot out there. Um, and you get, you know, medium format quality. 
So anybody who can still work in film, uh, it's worth picking one up. Um, this is the, the uh, opposite of, <laughs> of that uh, here in Iceland. Um, and th this I'm showing as a, a, uh, a technical problem, um, shooting digitally here. This is Icelandic museum that has a room called the D cell or D projects for emerging artists in Iceland. Uh, installation art is very trendy in Iceland. Um, and um, so here's Birta's installation, an extremely difficult room to shoot. It's not rectangular, it's, it's squares, it's this funny odd shape with this terrible column in the middle. And so I've got to be able to integrate, you know, architectural photography, uh, mixed lights, as you see, they've got neon lights in the ceiling, uh, just a horrific lighting scenario. Um, but again, with the, with the new digital cameras, uh, that gets easier and easier. Um, the artwork, I, I was a staff photographer at the Metropolitan Museum, as well as contributing editor at National Geographic Traveler. Um, I was able to uh, work between the two. And uh, having worked for this art magazine in Italy, I photographed everything from the Mona Lisa to cathedrals to um, just literally volumes of, of stuff. Th this is a funny picture because of behind the column on the right, there's a statue that I was told I could not photograph. So it was an architectural exercise in like how to hide this uh, questionable piece of art. Um, and, uh, but again, it's about capturing a mood and a spirit of place, uh, not just the architecture of, of, a, of a room. Um, Naples, another editorial assignment for um, Condé Nast Traveler. Uh, these are, there's a street vendor that I don't think exists anymore. Has anybody been to Naples? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, absolutely fantastic place. To, uh, if, if you, you know, want to go do some street photography, it's unbelievable. Absolutely. You know, you got to be careful of your cameras. Um, so you got to travel light and not have gear hanging around you um, because the street thieves are very, very fast and very quick. Um, but uh, this was a, an octopus soup stand that only came out at midnight. Um, and uh, uh, the, the pink newspaper in the foreground isn't just funny colors. The sports newspaper in Italy is pink. Um, anyway, the, 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 the guy behind there, you know, to me reminds me of the uh, Presepios, the, the Christmas uh, little statues that they're this traditional in Naples that they're famous for carving. Uh, another kind of nice traveler story, Naples. Um, again, Mamia six. Um, the um, uh, this is a more set up portrait. Um, uh, this was for the nice traveler also. Yes. Um, in Italy, um, the uh, prosciutto, the ham from Parma, is famous internationally, but the better ham in Italy is from this town called San Daniele. And this guy, Mr. Natale, Mr. Christmas, his job is absolutely fantastic. Um, he has a, a bone, it's, it's, you know, it looks about like this, but it's a carved piece of bone that he sticks into the ham in the joint and pulls it out and smells it to test whether the ham is ready or not, was it's maturing nicely. It's, it's, it should be next to the uh, fermented shark picture, actually. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to move them side by side. Um, but uh, So if you go to San Daniele, it's in Northeast Italy. Um, the, the, I've shot a lot of food photography uh, basically by accident. Um, as I was photographing hotels for Condé Nast Traveler, there was always restaurants. And then I, I worked for an Italian food and uh, wine magazine uh, that, that uh, did something really unusual. It, it, each issue would be shot by one photographer. And 
the art director decided to do this, I think, because uh, uh, family problems, he just simplified his life that for each issue, he would deal with one person. And he had to find a photographer who could shoot a variety of subjects and scenes and that. Um, um, until then, I really hadn't done a food assignment, uh, but I presented my work to him anyway. And, and uh, one of the creative pleasures of, of working in Italy, I've lived in Italy half my life, um, is that they are willing to take a risk. If it was in Paris, they would say, you know, you've never shot food, why are you even showing us your portfolio? Here there was an art director who was like, okay, I see you've got, you know, an eye, like, we'll try it. Um, out of that came around full circle. This was for a Smithsonian cover shoot. Um, the, the, um, there's a point that I'm gonna bring up later um, about um, having um, a purpose with what you're shooting. And, um, part of that purpose has to do with uh, the end place and the destination of your picture. So if you're shooting for Instagram, you're gonna shoot one way. And if you're shooting for a magazine cover, another. This was a case where the Smithsonian called me in Italy and said, Brooks, can you, you know, go tomorrow to shoot while I'm red in Paris for the cover? Because the, 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 the photo editor said, I've got, a, I'm stuck with pictures that were forced upon me by my editor, but I refused to run them on the cover. Can you send me a sketch? I'd never been to Poilin. I didn't know what the bread was about. There was This was pre-internet. Um, and uh, so I did a design sketch of how I imagined this loaf of bread coming out of an oven. And I don't have the sketch anymore, unfortunately, but it basically was like this. I flew to Paris, went to Poilin. If you're in Paris, go to Poilin. It is just the most delicious bread in the world. Um, and uh, the closest thing here is uh, to this, to Poilin bread is here in Iceland at Cuckoo's Nest. Um, when you come, to, please everybody come to Iceland and we'll, we'll go walking together um, and we'll go have bread at Cuckoo's Nest. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this was a cover shoot. Um, and this was, uh, I'll step back to people asking about question in the field. The only problem limitation that I had with the Mamiya 6 system is that if I needed to do a still life setup, um, uh, accurate close focus, it wasn't possible because there's a range finder, the Mamiya 6. Um, so this was Hasselblad. Um, and so in, in these situations, I'd switch over to a Hasselblad set, uh, series. Um, likewise, another just food on the counter. Um, when I first presented my work in New York, uh, I remember somebody, an art director saying to me, ew, I can't stand this kind of food. Uh, these are like Avedon's portraits. I just don't want to be that close. Uh, you know. So another art, art director complained uh, about uh, the food once uh, and saying, uh, and, and I said, look, I didn't make the food. I just took the picture. Um, so, Shooting food in Italy taught me how to shoot everything, call it live. I've never worked with a food stylist. Um, it just, I never uh, touch the food. If a chef can't present something that's worth photographing, they shouldn't be called a chef. They're just a line cook if they just throw a slop on a plate. Um, a chef should be able to present something that you just can look at and take a picture. Uh, so, lighting, I try and use the ambient light that's there. In film days, that was much more difficult than it is today. Much, much more difficult. Um, this is film. Um, and I, I, I started shooting food photography with big strobes and banks and all my gear and all that. But in Italy, this doesn't work because there's very limited times when a restaurant is open. So a restaurant opens at one o'clock for lunch and closes at the kitchen closes at 2.30. And then it opens at 7.30 in the evening and at you know, 10 o'clock the kitchen is closed. They will not prepare a dish for you in the afternoon. So I learned how to shoot in working restaurants without disturbing other customers. So my lighting went, got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So now I have a little bag of 
little flashlights that I use to light things on uh, a food situation like this. Um, just give the gold a little kick. And I don't do any of it uh, in post-production. For me, if you've done it in post-production, it's no longer a photograph. You know, I had students here who were always thinking, oh, I'll fix it in Photoshop. It's not a photograph anymore. It's an illustration. Doesn't mean it's good or bad, but it's, to me, it's not a photograph anymore. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if you have, to, I've, I've got a new rule on this. If wow. you have to spend more time fixing your picture in post than you did taking it, the picture wasn't worth taking in the first place. That's well. It's not entirely. I, I, I'm joking. <laughs> it's not entirely true because I, you know, I know, I know. Let me I just know, say yeah. one thing before you proceed, yeah. because with with modern day post processing opportunities, you can see things in the scene that you know you can bring to life in post that maybe you cannot bring to life in this situation. In maybe due to lack of lighting or other conditions, you know. But anyway, I'll, I'll yeah, 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 yeah. It's, 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 it's. I, I throw it as, as a tweaker. Um, <laughs> Move on. It's, you know, I've, I've done an enormous amount of post production work. Also, I've done all the pre press work for other photographers' books. It's not like I'm against or don't have the skills to do it. Um, I know. Anybody this. know Rax? I did all the pre press work for Last Days of the Arctic, um, and and other books. So it's not, a, it's not like I'm against post production. Um, in of itself, but it's a general guideline for your pictures. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, this was just on location again. You know, it was just presented to me for at dinner. Um, this is what uh, balsamic vinegar looks like uh, in its aging barrels, um, and uh, this is kind of a, a, an Icelandic joke here um, of a simulated magma. Uh, out on the Reykjanes Peninsula, um, it's where it's not far from where the earthquake earthquake is. Uh, sorry, it's not far from where the volcano is erupting right now. But here's a power plant, a geothermal power plant that thought they should make a plexiglass dome to simulate um, what what happens to nature in Iceland regularly. Um, these are just some covers, um, a variety of of editorial all that have, um, this is, you know, a collection of the amount of editorial that I've done. Um, and a note about editorial, it's, it's um, something that has disappeared, basically. It's almost last century. Uh, magazines still exist but it's not the same thing as it used to be, where there was a photo editor, where there was a process, a dynamic process happening to get pictures that illustrated a story. People ask me, what kind of pictures do I take? I said, you know, interesting one, challenging ones, um, like the picture of barbed wire down here in the, you know, Chelsea Magazine, actually it was for Smithsonian originally. Um, so you can see here, it's everything from people to food, to still life, to, um, I like challenging, difficult photographic opportunities. I'm not interested in shooting food just because it's food. Um, if it happens to be an interesting story, yes. I like the human story involved. Um, I like doing the homework. I like doing the research. Um, uh, this was the art magazine that I used to work for in Italy, um, FMR, uh, absolutely beautiful, um, did lots of books. Um, so. Um, let me jump. I see we're, we're I'm running on here. Um, the um, guiding. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of guiding um, indirectly. Uh, here in Iceland, there's a, an extraordinary museum on the south coast. Um, and um, Skogar, for now Skogar. Uh, Skogarsap, I was one of the guides there. Um, and I've guided for groups and small groups and um, been the fixer and line producer from film crews and TV crews. Um, and so I've got a, a good bit of experience working with people who need to make their pictures happen. Um, and I say this because when I'm guiding, 
I barely take any pictures or I don't take any pictures at all because I'm there for the people um, that are coming along. I have a camera just to make them feel, you know, comfortable that I have a camera, <laughs> but it's not about me taking my pictures when um, I'm guiding. And so for um, photo exploring, um, here I put together, um, I'm not gonna run these now. Um, I, I did a little slideshow um, of day tours of polar light and just Reykjavik of pictures that I like, pictures that pe people could possibly take if they were with me. Not pictures that are impossible to take uh, because of the conditions at the time. Um, for if anybody wants to do a slideshow like this, um, if there's a, a fantastic software um, called Photo Magico, uh, made in Germany, um, it just makes it wonderfully easy to uh, put together fantastic slideshows without wasting any time at the back end. Um, there's plenty of other softwares that do, but um, and you know Lightroom has a slideshow and things like that. But um, my go-to is Photo Magico for professionally presented slideshows. Um, so uh, let's see, um, what, have, what have I missed here? Um, and there's any, does anybody have any questions? Should we, should we start questions? Because I, I see we're, I wasn't paying attention to time here. Yeah, if we could um, just do a, a round of uh, Q and A's if anybody has any questions at this point. Yeah. Uh, that would be super great. You don't have any questions at the point. I, I think uh, what you've done there with the slideshows is 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 really cool because this is something we can, of course, you use it locally uh, in Iceland for your promotion. We can use it uh, to promote it globally, and we could use more of this type of content from any region and any, any destination. Um, so I think this is a great um, initiative from you, Brooks. Um, I yeah. have one question just about oh. tours. About since we're doing it from we're doing it from Reykjavik all the time in Iceland, or do we meet up in Grindavik or I, I can answer that. For, for now we we only run tours out of uh, Reykjavik. Okay. So the, the um, maybe, you know, Loewe's question also because this first picture is in Grindavik. Okay. Actually, the, the volcano is erupting directly behind the lighthouse. The volcano that's erupting right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is right behind the lighthouse. Okay. Um, so I, I put this as, as a day trip from Reykjavik. Exactly. Yeah. Um, in the same way that this is nearby also, um, it's all just, you know, an hour from Reykjavik, um, and this is Reykjavik. Uh, Shelby, without putting you on the spot, um, you, but you said you may, may have some questions regarding uh, doing the tours specifically, or, or maybe you have some, I didn't want to put you on the spot, it's just, you, you started no. out by saying that. Yeah. Um... I guess I just, I mean, I know everyone's going to want something different out of it. Um, I, I guess in general, I was just wondering what kinds of things people usually like. I mean, are people, you, I don't know. I'm, I just, I have no idea what to expect, except no. that I'm excited to do it, but I just want, I want people to feel like they're getting what they need out of it. So what, what they need is your interest in them. Correct. What they need is your interest in their photography. Yeah. Make sure that they get the photos that they want. Yeah. Oh, or, or learn about photography with you. Yeah. Some of them may not, they, they don't have an idea. I mean, somebody coming to Reykjavik may not have an idea of what photograph they want in Reykjavik. They want to take pictures in Reykjavik and learn along the way. Um, they might say, oh, I want to see 
Harpa, the, the new concert hall, um, which, which you building, don't like. <laughs> well, yeah, a building I don't like, but I can show them how I approach that professionally when I have a subject I really dislike. And it's my professional job to make an interesting picture out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Amsterdam is just so, so big. So I'm, you know, I've been talking with Anders about tour tours and um, I just hope I'm, yeah, I just hope to show them something really cool. That's not just the center of Amsterdam and make it personal. But then, yeah. But then they could obviously have been everywhere in Amsterdam as well. And, uh, but yeah, that, yeah. that's, I, I wouldn't, I, you know, if if you're, where are you originally from, Shelby? I'm from the U.S. Okay, so if you know, from where? I'm from Hawaii. From Hawaii! Wow, incredible. Um, uh, I, um, so you know, if you had a, your best friend from Hawaii visiting you in Amsterdam, yeah. where would you take them? I would show them the canal houses and you know the pretty bridges and the yeah the the city. You, you know, so take them on your personal. Scene, so your personal Amsterdam and along the way you can say this is you know oh this has been photographed a thousand times but if we cross the, the canal we can get a much more personal interesting picture out of it yeah you know for example the, the cover picture here on my Reykjavik photo exploring is a way of mushing together Leif Erikson who's a pagan who's on the front plaza of a Christian church is hilarious. For me, this picture is a joke because I'm combining two uh, conflicting elements in the picture and making a, a nice picture at the same time. You know, it's not the normal picture of the church that's up the avenue and, you know. And that's exactly also what we're trying to do. And, you know, because, and, and going back to Shelby's question is, is why we have the famous landmarks which you know, is for people coming to your city for the first time and don't want to spend time on, on, on Google Maps trying to figure out where this and that is. And then we have the Hidden Gems Tour where, is where we can, you know, dig deeper into the city and show interesting courtyards and, and, and things that may be a little bit off the beaten track of things. And, and exactly what Bruce is saying here is, is also is what I've been preaching is, you know, even though we do the famous landmarks tour, try to get something in your compos composition out of a, you know, a, a very much photographed object that is different and then the customer can take with them home and say, okay, yeah, you know, actually there's, you know, I have these, odd looking angles of uh, you know the royal palace or whatever that is 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 kind of different from what everybody else does like, and, like this Reykjavik picture here um has a, a bunch of sort of classroom elements to it um you know, or it could be photo tour elements in that i i needed it to be landscape to fit the slideshow right i needed it to be it could be any day in Reykjavik, not just some, you know, I have the Aurora in the behind, not a special Aurora night. Um, I, I purposely went around and photographed everything with my iPhones so that we could say this, these tours have nothing to do with your gear. Yes, if you have an iPhone Pro, it's better than the regular iPhone, but you know. Um, so this was shot with an iPhone on purpose in a format that is the end destination. And the end destination purpose is a, a key thing in any of my classes, tours, uh, uh, photography lectures of, you know, what, what's the end purpose? Is it just to make a pretty picture or is it gonna be a picture that tells an interesting story in a predefined way? You know, Brooks, I really liked what you said about, it's giving me a new idea when you said, make it personal about them. So I'm thinking now, let's say Martin Parr was coming, <laughs> you know, or someone that I, with him, we know what kind of pictures he takes. But let's say I didn't know, but I could ask maybe to see some of their Instagram photos or I could really get to know what do you know? Because I'm very good at giving students ideas, but, you know, if I knew that they like, I don't know, maybe they like, well, if I know Martin Parr, I would, you know, and I know his story when he went to boring and photographed all the boring signs and, 
Right, and but, then I could try to figure out, like, what would Martin Parr like? I mean, he might not need me, but then I could be useful to him and see, you know, I want to show you the best, you know, place for taking a, your photo in my city. And yeah, that, I think that gives me some new ideas. Yeah, I mean, I, I think asking people what they, and not just what they're interested in, because they'll say, oh, sure, anything, but having them show you just a few pictures, doesn't matter where, that they've taken that they like of their own. That's really it'll, smart, yeah. It'll summarize immediately the level of photography, the type of camera they use, the what their interest is. And they might also be really, you know, they may have a developed style. And I don't mean like now the teenage, like, oh, this is my style, but a, a well-developed kind of photography practice. And it would be really great if you understood what that was, because that would make them feel great. And yeah. then, yeah. I, I mean, an example of that was a photographer that I met, a professional photographer who had clients like Federal Express and stuff. He was doing a, um, a workshop with my friend, Sam Abel. And there were people who were never had an assignment in their lives in the workshop also. And I asked him, why are you doing this workshop? You know, you're, you're a commercially successful working pro. And he said, I want to break out of, you know, my commercial box. So it, it could be that. And it could be, you know, somebody who wants to take better pictures with their iPhone. Yeah. And unless we ask them and pull it out of them, um, we, we won't, it can't, I don't want anybody mm. to take pictures the way I take pictures. I don't want my students to imitate a single thing that I'm doing. I, not that I care, but I want them to do what's right for them. Right. Yeah. But let me round this off by yeah. by by saying, um, I think I've mentioned it a few times before. Uh, in in terms of what we can expect from our customers, is that we can't expect anything because we the 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 tour we we did here in this this year in in Sofia turned out to be a brother and a sister showing up with smartphones, um, and. I, I mentioned to some before that I had a tour in Copenhagen with, with a long time, he wasn't professional, but a very enthusiastic and, and skilled photographer. I don't think he did a single picture on the entire tour because that, that was not his prerogative. He wasn't interested in that. He was just in, interested in, in conversation with another photographer. So, I mean, they come in all kinds of shapes and colors and uh, and, and preferences so we, do, we don't know but we, we meet them where they are and say you know let's get the best out of the three hours we're together and, and that's, that's what they want they want you know uh, a photographer to, to bounce um, their, maybe their ideas or their insecurities or wherever they are in, in, in their photography at the point is it possible to ask them a couple of questions? I mean, that they don't have to answer, but like one to three questions in writing to send ahead? No. Like if it, no? No. I mean, it, it, well, we could do it through our platform uh, if, if bookings come through directly through our website, uh, but not if we, we get them through our booking partners okay. uh, because that's a process we don't control. But I also think that would be kind of overstepping um, some boundaries um, in, in, in some way. But I think, I mean, it, personally, I spent the first five minutes with people trying to gauge where they are. And as Brooke says, you know, asking about their, that, that's a super good idea. And I think I will use that going forward as well. Uh, but simply just gauging where they are, um, asking them a few questions about um, their photography, their likes, and, and, and also, if you, you spot the type of camera they're bringing and how it's set, you know, everything, everything is set on P or A on their camera, you kind of gauge where they are in, in, in their skill set. And, and we take it from there. I mean, we're not trying to intimidate people with all kinds of technical mumbo jumbo about aperture and shutter speeds and so and so. But if we can, you know, if they can bring something from a tour and, and they've actually learned something, uh, then our mission is 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 complete, and, and maybe they even come back. So let, let me just add a little another practical thing that I've done um, is 
find a, a, a coffee shop um, as my starting point, a coffee shop or, a, you know, a, a, a meeting place. So if there's bad weather, you, you can um, have a cup of coffee with people before you begin the tour mm -hmm. without the cameras, without like, okay, we're meeting on the corner here and starting to walk there. Give it the, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes beforehand, just together to chat. And the, th the questions you would like ahead of time in an email get answered very quickly right there. I, I can say from, from experience with doing the tours in Copenhagen, we actually encountered quite a few people who after a while will say, maybe we should stop for a coffee, uh, you know, and, and just take a break because it can be overwhelming, even though it's only three hours and five kil kilometers of walking distance maybe there's just too much information in their head at the same time. And so they want to break off. And if you gauge the people are getting tired, maybe you can suggest, Hey, let's stop for a coffee for 10 minutes and, you know, talk about what we've done so far. And so, uh, like, and, you know, plan my walking trips, at least in Reykjavik at a place, even if it's in the evening where we can yeah. stop and, you know, have a beer together afterwards. I mean, we have these fixed routes in all the cities and we need to have them uh, because we need always to have a plan of what we do. But I, I keep saying again and again that these are personal tours and people are paying for your time and your attention. And so if you want to mix things up or if a spook says, we've already seen this, many, I've been there, done that. I don't, we just go somewhere else and we, we find alternatives to do and we can easily do that as long as they're happy and and agree that that's what we're doing. All right. Oh, thanks. A any further questions before we uh, break it up, as we say? Okay. Um, Brooks, thank, thank you, you so much. Everybody. Thank you so much thank for you. doing this. Um, and we'll come up with a, another funky um, lecture uh, at some point soon. Uh, we'll announce that of course uh, and once we've uh, put up the recording somewhere I'll send you all a link to it but, um, and for everybody who's not in Iceland you know if you're coming to Iceland please contact me and uh, and we'll, we'll go out together we'll just absolutely that's what the team is for yeah can you uh, drop the link to your website as well or is it just your name we'll is, find it. my name dot net Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks everybody. Yep. Super. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Have a great evening. Bye. Later. Just... Bye bye. Thanks, bye -bye. Brooks. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.